dot on your target, then you blow the shit out the motherfucker. The story of Death Row Records was probably one of the one of the great stories that happened, uh, you know, in America in the mid '90s. Steve and Lee and I were sitting and looking at footage, and we were looking at the transcripts, and we realized we had a tremendous amount of material about Ruthless Records and N.W.A. and the absolute origins of gangster rap. I said, I'm going to write a screenplay called Straight Outta Compton based on all this material that we've captured. They was bringing, you know, South Central to the forefront, and what was happening, and you know, drugs and the whole shot. I mean, they was hitting another element of a society that nobody else had touched on. We really learned much more about Suge Knight as the process went on. His proximity to being a bodyguard, he learned to understand that there were some issues that Dr. Dre and other members that were in the Ruthless Records fold were having. Whoever he had to step on to get there, his main objective was to just get there. This guy had been extraordinarily successful, unbelievably successful. He'd made millions and millions of dollars. Death Row Records, Suge Knight, these people at the guns and the trouble in the east and the west, oh boy. But I thought about it for about two seconds. I said, that's a great story. When do we start? We probably didn't truly understand how dangerous this story was until we got into it. This is Michael Harris, a man drug agents describe as a major cocaine trafficker. Michael Harris said, oh, you don't have to worry about a thing. You've got a ghetto pass when you're with me. We had Suge Knight in jail. If Suge Knight had been out, it probably would have been virtually impossible to capture the interviews that we did because he terrifies people. Suge grabbed me by my feet and everything went haywire. He loosened up my teeth and I had two black eyes. For a three-year process, you're waiting. I mean, you're, you're sitting there going, God, if something happens to the people that work here, this is really going to be, this is on me. Very, very early on, Lydia came in, and she opens up her handbag just enough to let me know that she has a handgun in there. I am, at this point, thinking, what did I get myself into? There was crazy stuff that happened in the interviews. What would Suge say if he heard me say this? What would Michael Harris say if he heard me say this on camera? They were frightened, plain and simple. And we sent a, a crew up to, to Oakland and, uh, you know, guns were pulled. We, I felt, were no longer in control of our own production. Suge Knight starts a label from nothing and uh, delivers six consecutive multi-platinum albums. Just absolutely crazy, unprecedented. The Death Row record story can literally be five or six different films. There is that much material. The prequel to the story of the rise and fall of Death Row was the story of N.W.A. and, and Ruthless. The relationship between Eazy-E and Jerry and the other acts that were developed there. The development of Dr. Dre within Ruthless because that's what Suge Knight sizes up and decides that he's going to take. He's going to rip the guts out of Ruthless Records, which is what he did. 